Good morning, guys. Welcome back to the channel or the group on Facebook, Daughter of Increase. For those of you who are watching this on YouTube, my name is Nate Denise, and I post new videos every Tuesday and Thursday all about my faith, God, Christ, and expanding the kingdom of God. Today's video is going to be part two to the John chapter four study. I actually was trying to do this live today, which is Thursday, in the group, but for some reason, my Facebook app keeps on acting up every time I open it to the group section and let's see if it'll work. So like, I'm here and if it doesn't do it now, I'm going to be upset. But every time I go here, nothing really loads and then it does this. See, Facebook has stopped. I've updated the app. I've tried numerous times. I'm going to try again. I've been trying for a while and it just it doesn't open up like I can't even but it will work for like any other thing that I need to do so I don't know I don't know what's going on but we're just gonna push through so I'm recording this during the time I'm supposed to be doing the live so that I can upload this to the group on Facebook but I'll also be putting it on YouTube and I'm also going to be recording chapter 5 as well in two parts just because my mother is having is having a procedure next week and um, it's on Wednesday next week and that Thursday will be like the first day after her procedure and I want to make sure that I'm able to just maneuver and do things to help her around the house and whatnot so I'm going to be recording chapter 5 as well so yes for those of you who are not in the Facebook group, I did decide that I didn't want to rush through this study because originally I wanted to just finish John before Christmas time so that in 2019 we can do new things. But because John, I feel like, is an essential book of the Bible that everyone should really study. And I love it myself. I've studied it already personally, but this second time through I'm learning a lot more as well. I don't want to rush it. So I've decided to complete up to chapter 10. I think it'll be like the week before Christmas and then a week or two after New Year's I'll dive back in and then we'll finish up chapters 11 to 21 so that's how I'm gonna do this so John is basically gonna be done in two parts we're gonna finish up to chapter 10 this year and then next year starting in January we're gonna go back into it until we get to the end and um, yeah that's pretty much it so i'm gonna quickly do a quick prayer and then just dive into this because we left off at verse 15 if you haven't already seen part one just click the eye on the screen for that but um we've done verse 15 and now we need to do 16 through 54 and i want to try to get that done within an hour hour and a half doing this video um if i can find my notes here they are um so let me just pray us in um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for giving us breath in our bodies and for making us like Adam, like you did. Father God, I am asking that you use me as your vessel so that I may speak the words that you would have me speak as I guide people through this study. Father God, I'm asking that we all grasp something that we can live by and move by from today's study, Father God. Amen. <laughs> you guys know I'm still... A little I still get nervous when I'm praying out loud um, but yeah so I already have my John chapter 4 live notes if you don't have them click down below in the description bar or if you're in the Facebook group just check the file section I have all the files there but you can check on Google Drive link down below or Facebook for all the files I'm gonna start doing it this way because having my computer up while trying to look at the screen and all that stuff is just too much so we are going to dive back in today, starting with chapter, I mean chapter 16, <laughs> verse 16, if you will. And, um, yeah, but before I begin, the Bible that I'm using is the ESV translation from Crossway. I don't know what I just did with the packaging, but... This is the Crossway Single Column Journaling Bible in the ESV translation. I personally prefer the New King James, but I do like to use the ESV when I'm on YouTube because not a lot of people that watch my channel, um, some are new to their faith and some aren't new to the faith. They're just new to studying their word differently. So I just prefer the ESV. Next year, once um, next year, I think I'm going to start doing a lot more with the New King James because I personally love that translation. But that's the Bible that I'm using. I have my two 
post-it notes. This is just a regular post-it from the actual post-it brand. And these are from Pen and Gear, I believe, from Walmart, the pineapple. I wanted to just use this up since we're diving into fall. I have my Crayola Twistable Crayon. I mean, quite Crayola Twistable Colored Pencils, which are the ones that I started out with, and I'm going back to these today. And then I just have these two um, super tip markers here from Crayola as well. They were just sitting there, so I'm using them. I know my nails look hit, you guys. I'm well aware that they are looking all beat up. I need to take off the nail polish, but I'll do that after the video. <laughs> and um, the pen I'm using is the Pigma Micron 01 Archival Ink. This is in the 0.25 millimeter. I don't know if you guys see it, but... We're going to dive in. I'm going to quickly read through. So we're going to do this section by section. So I'm going to start off with the first one, which goes from verse 16 down to verse 26. If you hear any humming, I apologize. My window has the, uh, I don't even know what it is, but it kind of like if you put the air on inside the house, you can hear it humming outside. So whatever that is. But yes, I am ready to go. I have my coffee in front of me. A quick little breakfast that I made for myself. Just some um, sandwiches that I done put in like a heart shape just because. And yes, let me put my phone on silent and not vibrate so that we can dive right in. And all right, let me get my coffee. I'm sorry guys, I should have had all this set, but I was planning to go live this morning, but. Mm-hmm. Coffee. All this stuff on my bed. I'm sorry guys, this is so random. Anyways, diving in, starting at verse 16. I'm not sure if this is focused enough. Hopefully you guys are good okay so starting at 16 Jesus said, Jesus said to her go call your husband and come here the woman answered him I have no husband Jesus said to her you are right in saying I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband what you have said is true verse 19 the woman said to him sir I perceive that you are a prophet our fathers worshiped on this mountain but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship Jesus said to her woman believe me the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father you worship what you do not know we worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews verse 23 but the hour is coming and now is here and is now here sorry when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such people to worship him verse 24 god is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth verse 25 the woman said to him i know that the messiah is coming and he who is called he who is called christ when he comes he will tell us all things jesus said to her i who speak to you am he yeah, I'm still getting used to getting back into the videos <laughs> again with you ladies um, and for the fellows who are watching my channel as well. But I read that through and if you guys are new to my channel, new to the group and don't know the process, what I do is the first step that I do is I read one paragraph, a whole chapter, however I feel fit to do so, I will read completely through without any markings the second time which we're about to do I go through the second time and I circle words that I want to define and these are words that I either know don't know or I think I know whether I know them or not I like to circle them because I look them up in the Greek translation to get the Greek definition I prefer to look up them in the Greek definition as the New Testament was written in Greek because a lot of the times the words don't mean what we think they mean um, they, def they they had different meanings back then and according to the context of the scripture. So that's what I prefer to do. So after circling, I then go in and I underline things that um, kind of like stick out to me. Parts of phrases, a whole phrase, bracket a whole paragraph. It can be whatever it like, whatever sticks out to you, but whatever I feel like is crucial 
or parts that I really want to pick apart and dive deeper into, I underline or I box it in some cases. Once I do that, I then go in and take my notes, which you guys see here on the side, like my notes here. And then I add color so that I can know what goes with what as far as like corresponding notes and stuff. Oh, here is the thing for the Bible. So again, this is a Bible I'm using, guys. Okay, so. Now that we've done that, let's see. Did I have any words that I wanted to define? Yes. Verse 19, perceive. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So I'm going to circle perceive. Verse 20, worship. Verse 21, believe. Did I have another one? Yes, I had a few more. Verse 22, I had salvation. Verse 23, seeking. And I believe that was all because the next one is for verse 20. So, yes, okay. So those were the few words that I wanted to define. So I have perceive, worship, believe, salvation, and seeking. So what I do need now is my Sharpie pen. Actually, a regular pen. I forgot these post-it notes are crazy and I'm going to go back to the post-it notes that I used in the previous video with definitions to write them down so the first one I said was perceive so I'm just going to write that down perceive and then box it so the Greek word for that is theria so here's perceive Greek word I can't pronounce that, but the meaning is to look at, experience, or discern. So that's what I'm going to write. I'm going to write the Greek word. Like, it looks like the Oreo, but I'm pretty sure there's a pronunciation with the O's, so, yep. And it's to look at. experience or discern the next word was worship the Greek word for that is proskino proskino I don't I don't know um, and it means to do reverence to prostrate oneself to adore on one's knees and then we have believe, which the Greek word for that is pisto, pistio, which is to entrust, have faith in, to credit, or to have confidence in. So I'm going to write those down now and then move on to the next two. You might hear a bit of crinkling. Let me just move it. That crinkling just now was um, some paper that I had for my printer Ugh, okay sorry about the shaking but worship Prosk, you know which is to do reverence to prostrate oneself to adore on one's knees. We have belief, which I showed you guys already, which is pistio. I'm probably saying these words wrong. You can definitely look these words up yourself. Um, for those of you who don't know how, I actually have apps on my phone 
I have Bible Hub and then Blue Letter Bible. Blue Letter Bible I prefer because it actually gives you um, the pronunciation of the words compared to Bible Hub, which doesn't. So we need to go to John, which is in the New Testament. Sorry. So where's John? John, John, chapter 4. And we're at verse, what verse is that? We'll start at verse 19. Into linear. And then for perceive, Therio. Strong's G, 2334. Theoreo. See? Theoreo. Theoreo is how you would say the word for perceive. Um... My only gripe is that there's no way for you to like switch easily. Let's go to 20 for the word worship because I definitely don't know that. Strong's G, 4352. And then let's do one more for believe. Which is in 21. Strong's G, 4100. Pistuo. Pistuo. So I like using Blue Letter Bible app for that to get the pronunciations. Um, Pistuo. See, I was saying all these words all wrong. But it's to entrust. Have faith in. To credit, to have confidence in, and moving on, the next word is salvation. I can put this back here because I don't need it anymore. So the next word is salvation. If you guys will see this, um, so the Greek word is that there, which is the messianic salvation. But I looked it up on like in this definition, and it's the Preservation or deliverance from harm, ruin, or loss caused by sin. And then the last word that I wanted to define was seeking, which the Greek word is a tie, meaning to search or desire for, to require or demand. So I'm going to write those down. Salvation. And as I'm writing that, I'm going to chew on my sandwich. <laughs> I hope I said preservation and not preservation because that would be weird. I don't remember what I said, but I, it's preservation. Okay. So now, if you know me, you know my next step. Color. <laughs> Can't do anything without color in my life. And I'm actually going to use some other ones that I have, actually. And here. So I just took out a few more of the super tips and then I have my Sharpie Smear God highlighters. These are actually the colors that I use when I'm reading my Christian books, which I'll do a video on annotating um, my books because that's where I got these from. 
But if you want to learn more about annotating, check out my sis Angela's video over at Transform Through God's Word. She did an awesome, awesome video that sparked my interest at changing the way I personally do a lot of my annotating when I'm reading. But right now I'm just throwing color so that everything just doesn't look black on black. And I'm realizing that I prefer to write in blue ink pen just because it's too much black on the page. So I'll be getting new blue pens. I need some new blue ones actually. Because the blue pens that I've currently, I mean, I don't have any blue pens currently that are in the 0.7 range. Okay, so definitions are done. So now we are going to start off with note taking. So starting at verse 16, Jesus said to her, go call your husband, come here. I'm going to underline the part where he says, go call your husband, come here. I'm underlining that because this was basically an appropriate request for a man speaking to a woman to have her husband present and to do the talking. Um, we already know that back in the first couple of chapters, it is very different or very out of the, out of the norm for a Jew to speak to a Samaritan, let alone a Samaritan woman. So when a man is speaking to a woman, he is supposed to request that her husband be present because he is not supposed to really converse with her, but supposed to converse with the man himself. So this was nothing out of the ordinary or so it seemed. So I'm going to write custom for husband to be requested now we all know who Jesus is we know Jesus knows things before he even says them or asks us a question so to her this didn't seem out of the ordinary um, him asking for her husband but he knew exactly what he was doing he knew that she wasn't married so this was how he began to engage in conversation with her as well as um to show his power without revealing his power if you will so then moving on to 17 um so 17 to 18 is all about her saying she doesn't have a husband and you know how he said you're right and he she has five husbands so this whole conversation in verses 17 and 18 Really, it's just Jesus speaking about her sinful lifestyle, but still showing love and respect toward her, regardless of the fact. So, I'm going to actually bracket 17 to 18, but I'm also going to do some underlining as well. So, 17 to 18, I'm, I'm bracketing because I want to make sure that I understand that this was just, you know, him speaking about her sinful life, but still showing love and respect toward her. Which I think is something that a lot of us need to learn to do, because... When we learn or find out about someone who's committed or sin or crime or whatever, we become very disrespectful and unloving towards them. But in this example here, we have Jesus understanding that this woman, God knows what she was doing with these men. She wasn't married. So, I mean, she's gone through about six men that were calculating just alone in this scripture. We don't know her whole full life, but she's gone through five husbands plus the man she's now living with who is not her husband so the man she's shocking up with and i'm pretty sure she's having sex with these men so this lady is considered sinful and she's a samaritan woman so you know jesus didn't just like turn his back on her or disrespect her because of her her past or what she's currently dealing with no he still showed love toward her and he still showed respect toward her but um that's for 17 and 18 so i need to figure out where i'm gonna put this I'm probably just going to have to write it on the post-it note. So, I'm going to write uh, V1718. I'm not, I don't know why I'm writing with this instead of a pen. <laughs> Okay, so Jesus speaking 
about her sinful life. But still showing love and respect. I'm also going to write that he is basically kind of revealing his power without the theatrics to it or like the the miracle working stuff to it. So, um, hopefully you guys can see that chord. I'm going to move that out the way. Okay. Revealing his power. Okay, so now going back to verse 17 and 18. I have no husband is what the lady said. So, I'm going to underline I have no husband. I'm going to underline where he says you're right in saying I have no husband. I'm going to underline where it says for you have had five husbands. And then I'm going to underline the last part. The one you now have is not your husband. What you said is true. Okay. So, I have no husband. Basically, the woman knew she was not married to any man, but was shocking with one. So, she was aware of, um, I guess, the, the, the sinful act that she was committing. She understood that she was shocking up with a man. So, that's the first part of that, right? So, verse 17... Oh, sorry, you guys can see that. I put V17. I have no husband, so... Let's move this Bible up a bit so I can write my notes. I'm going to say shacking. You can put whatever way you want to put it. But, um... She knew she was shacking up. So that's the first part, right? Then it says... You are right in saying I have no husband. So that's still verse 17. Okay. So with that being said, Jesus already knew that she had no husband currently. And he was aware of her living situation. So Jesus knew about her status and living. So it wasn't a shocker, because you know how sometimes when you ask a question, you're asking to know, but Jesus didn't ask to know. He basically asked her to make a point that he already knew about her lifestyle, like he knew what it was that she was doing. So now we're going to verse 18, to the part where it says, for you have had five husbands. So not only did he know that she was living with a man and she, he knew that it wasn't her husband but he also knew that she was married five previous times um with other men so he knew her past so then for the last part it says the one you now have is not your husband what you have said is true so, Jesus confronted her sinful lifestyle to give her the option to love him or her sinful nature. When Jesus said that the man she lived with was not her husband, Jesus was showing that living together in marriage are not the same. Jesus also showed that just because someone calls a relationship a marriage, it does not mean that Jesus considers it a marriage. So, in him saying... The one that you have now is not your husband. He is letting her know that one, what she's doing is a sin. And not only is it a sin, but she's also been married five previous times, which means that she's been divorced. And we all know, I think it's in Malachi. God, um, through the prophet Malachi, says that he does not like marriage. He, dis he dislikes marriage. I don't know the exact verse. Um, and I'm actually going to look it up right now because I know it's in Malachi. Um... It's something about marriage that he completely, like, he hates it or... So I'm going to look it up because I don't want to give you, like, the wrong information. But it's in Malachi. <laughs> I know that for a fact. So I'm going to actually just type divorce. And I'm using the Holy Bible app to look it up. So... Okay, yeah, so it's in Malachi 2.16. It says, For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce for it covers one garment with violence 
and yeah so malachi 2 16 is when he talks about how he hates divorce so this lady has been divorced not one time not two times five times and she's now shocking up with a man that is not her husband and just because they're living together does not mean that their relationship is considered a marriage because it's there's no legal um or like binding contract covenant between the man and the wife the woman with god so that's that um so basically what i'm gonna write is that jesus confronted her sinful lifestyle giving her the option yeah, I know my hand looks my handwriting ends up looking like chicken scratch. So <laughs> giving her the option to love him or her sinful nature. So that's that for verse 18. Okay. So moving on to verse 19 actually before I do that color because my eyesight is getting crazy so let's make that one gray let's make this one mint Okay, I got color down. So moving on to verse 19. Let's see. I'm going to underline the part where it says, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Basically, she made a normal observation after her conversation with him and all that he revealed concerning her. She was stunned that Jesus had supernatural knowledge of her. So... I'm going to write, she realized he had, and I need to capitalize it, he had supernatural knowledge of her. In simple words, you can just say that she realized that he knew her, even though she didn't really know him. Moving on to 20, it says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And then I'm just going to keep going down, underlining to 24. So then I'm going to go to 21, where it says, Our. The hour is coming when neither. On this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So, I'm going to underline that portion. Going to 22, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. And then I'm going to underline for salvation is from the Jews. Going to 23, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. And then I'm going to underline God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, which is on the other side. Um, I'll just underline it now, maybe. So. Um, I'm trying to make sure this is in frame. Okay. 
thou must worship him in spirit and truth. For 25, I'm going to underline the part where she says, I know that the Messiah is coming. He who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. In 26, I'm going to underline, I who speak to you and he. So I'm going to go back now to do my notes. Um, and I guess a lot of my notes will be on post-its because I have no more space here. So... I'm going to do verse 19. No, I'm not. Verse 20, because I already did verse 19. Haha. <laughs> this is why I prefer color in my life, because without color, I get confused. Again, verse 20, it says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. So in her mind, there had to be a specific place of worship. And this is where they had permission to build a temple in worship. You can find the cross-references for that, which I'll, yeah, I'll read those. Um, and I'm going to read cross-references in New King James. Just because I feel like I prefer to read it in that translation. <laughs> but um, Genesis 12... I'm trying to figure out which one I want to read. I'm not going to read all of them. It's just too many cross references to read. Okay, I'll read this one. So, anyway, for verse 20, in her mind, there had to be a specific. Place of worship, and honestly, I think a lot of people feel that they have to worship in a specific place. Um, personally, me, I can worship wherever I am. I can worship on my bed, this chair, in the shower, in the kitchen when I'm cooking, in church, in the car, in the cab. Like you can worship anywhere, but a lot of people don't understand that they feel like they have to worship in one specific location and can't worship outside of that location. And that's not the truth at all. You definitely can worship wherever you choose, wherever you want to, wherever you feel comfortable, and wherever you are in which you seek the um, secret place. It doesn't always have to be in the confinements of a church or in a, a little box. There's an endless bunch of locations, uh, an infinite amount of locations you can worship the Lord. It doesn't matter where it is. As long as your heart and your mind is right and you're in the spirit, then you're per you're perfectly fine to do so. Um, so. And like I said, this is where they have permission to build a temple and worship. Um. Oh, I'm so sorry about that, you guys. <laughs> Going to verse 21. When, um, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So basically, Jesus begins to speak of a time of worship that will no longer be focused on a place. Worship will not depend on a place to do so. So, worship will not depend on a location.
So, moving to verse 22. Verse 22. I'm going to say ignorance of God. And I'm going to explain that in a second. I just wanted to write that so I can get this posted out of the way. But okay, verse 20 said, 22 says, You worship what you do not know. So basically, Samaritans believe Moses commissioned an altar on Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessings, which was a justifi justification of their system of worship on the mountain, which is why she said our fathers worshipped on this mountain. Um, but they didn't truly know what they were truly doing and to whom, which was basically they had an ignorance of who God was, right? But then we have Jesus continuing to say we worship what we know. Um, so let's just use this yellow. We worship what we know. And for salvation is from the Jews. So again... Verse 22. We worship what we know. So basically Jesus associates himself with the Jews who were different in their worship because they understood everything concerning their worship. So Jews understood their worship. And then the last part of that says, for salvation is from the Jews. So, Jews knew God and his word, so they were able to receive salvation from their spiritual knowledge. So, Jews received salvation from spiritual knowledge. And I feel like there is a lot more to that, so I would even personally box that part where it says, for salvation is from the Jews. Just because, like, I feel like there's something more to that verse that I can definitely, like, pull out. But I just, in my research, I couldn't find anything. Oh, good coffee. Um, so, yeah. So, moving along. Verse 23 says, For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. And he's what he's seeking is true worshipers that will worship him in spirit and truth, obviously. If you continue reading that. Um, and we understand the definition of seeking, which is to search or desire for, or it's to require or demand. So it can be that he's, you know, requiring people that will be true worshipers, that will worship him in spirit and truth. He's desiring for it, and he's demanding it of people. So, God is seeking a people with a sincere heart for him, for his word, and to do his will, and to worship him wholly. And I knew I had a problem here, but whatever. Um, so, God is seeking those with... A sincere heart. I don't even think I spelled that right, did I? Yes, I did. which is God is spirit and those who worship him
must worship him. I'm sorry, must worship in spirit and truth. So for that, uh, true worship is when you are concerned with spiritual realities and not the surroundings. And you worship according to the whole counsel of God's word. So that's basically what I'm getting from the whole be a worshiper. Um, how we must worship in spirit and truth. Because when you're worshiping in the spirit, you're not concerned about who you, who's around you or what other people are saying or what other people are doing. It's kind of like when you're in church praying. Yes, like I was saying, it's kind of like when you're in church and they tell everyone to pray and some people will pray, but they won't um, allow themselves to go deep into prayer just because they're concerned about their surroundings. I have seen men, and no disrespect to any man who like does this in church, but I have seen men sprawls out face first on the floor tears not the whole nine screaming and crying giving god the glory praise and the honor and that's what it's kind of like when you're um worshiping in spirit and in truth and i'm using men as an example because women we obviously have no problem um you know giving god the glory and stuff in church sometimes i find that i do only because in my mind, I don't like to be like the center of attention and people do look at other people when they're like praying and stuff. That's just, I mean, I know I was a kid in church, so I know, but, um, I'm, I'm using men as an example because not a lot of men who go to church, um, do fully pray and worship God the way they should or the way they desire to because they're so concerned with keeping an image up and some women are the same way some women don't want to do it because a lot of people consider it to be weak but um no when you're really worshiping in spirit and truth you don't care about where you are who you're in front of who's around you with anybody else with your next door neighbor with your the person sitting next to you in church is praying about because you're praying to God for you you're interceding for yourself or for whoever you're speaking to god you're giving him glory you're focused on him so that's kind of what what is what it's saying so um i'm gonna say concerned with spiritual realities not surroundings worship according to the whole council of his word Just move that over. So I know that the Messiah is coming. He who was called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. So the first part in verse 25. Basically, um, she may be blinded spiritually, but she does know of the Messiah, which means that God has been working on her heart for some time, preparing her for this divine appointment of meeting Jesus. So, maybe blinded, but God was doing a work in her. Before divine appointments it says when he comes he will tell us all things she speaks of hope in the messianic prophecies is basically what she's talking about she speaks of hope in messianic prophecies verse 26 he revealed himself
two sinners. Um, so yeah, when Jesus said to her, I, I who speak to you am he, he revealed himself to sinners without regard of their sins. He didn't care that, um, you know, she went through six men. He didn't care that she wasn't married. He knew that he was there for a purpose and without regard to her sin, knew that she needed to be saved, knew that she needed a hand to help her out of her destruction, if you will. And so he revealed himself to sinner. Um, to a sinner, and he also did so with the rest of the people as we will continue on. But, um, okay, that's 26. So now we're gonna do 27 to 30. And I can actually just stick this post it note back on the front over here. So let's read 27 to 30 and when his disciples came they marveled that he was talking with a woman but no one said what do you seek or why are you talking with her so the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people come see a man who told me all i ever did all that i ever did can this be the christ they went out of the town and were coming to him so first things first definitions do i have any i have one one definition and that is 27 and the word is marbled and i think that's the only definition i have for there so marbled the greek word is it's thumazum i don't even know how to say it this word right here but it means to admire wonder at or have admiration in and so we're just going to stick that on the bottom of this sticky note. And then I'm just going to stick this sticky note back over here. I'm going to move these sticky notes for a second so I can take my notes without worrying. Same with these. I'm just going to move them. Okay. What I didn't do was pop a color, so I'm just going to use this purple. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. The disciples were surprised that Jesus stretched the limits of cultural propriety with the extended conversation with the Samaritan woman. So... I'm going to say Jesus stretched limits of culture by speaking with her. As I said, this was not a normal thing. Jews and Samaritans did not get along and men did not speak to women publicly. Going to verse 28, the woman left her water jar and went away into town. I went a little too far, so just the woman left her water jar and went away into town. 
Um, basically, this woman left of everything she needed in order to go back to the people. So, she went, obviously, to the well to retrieve water for whatever her needs were, be it to cook, to clean, to shower, to just drink, or whatever the case may be. But she dropped the very thing that she went there for because she felt like she had to go to the people. She felt that speaking to the people were way, was way more important than the water that she initially went there for. So... She left. The very thing. She needed. In order. To speak. To. The people. And keep in mind, I'm pretty sure this whole conversation, she did not even fill it up with water. So, the very thing she intended to do when she went, she never was able to do. Um, then in 29, it says, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And then going to 30, I'm just going to underline the whole thing. My eyes are getting crazy. So, color. Now we got some color going, so my eyes don't get crazy. So again, going to 29. Um, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? This woman was compelled to testify about the things that he said to her. So don't be afraid to share the things of God with others. His love for her compelled her to share his love with others. Um, there we go. His love for her His love for her compelled her to share his love with others. Share the things of God. And I'm just going to connect that. So going to 30, they went out of the town and were coming to him. So her invitation and her testimony pulled others to come to him for themselves. So the question here that I got is, are you winning souls by sharing your testimony and inviting others to Christ? So when I say that, I mean... I'll use myself as an example. When I was in college, I ran across a few women. Um, well, I'm saying one, but young ladies in my class. Some people within like my um, my grade, if you will, because there was really no grades, freshman, sophomore, senior. So um, was in my, I guess my grade, if you will. And for some reason, I always felt compelled when we were having conversations about things we probably shouldn't have been having conversations about. But I mean, if you was in college, you know them college days. Um, so we would have conversations about like guys and stuff like that. And it would come to a point where a, a young lady would like share something that happened to her. And I would feel compelled to share my testimony and dealing with that situation. And then that would open up them asking me, well, how did I you know get over it or what helped me and that would make way 
for me to share with them the things of God and how um, Jesus has helped me and stuff like that. So in me doing that, some of these women have actually gone to churches. They went to the like the, the ministries on campus or they like bought Bibles and stuff like that. And even even more so, a more recent thing is here with the YouTube that I'm doing in the Facebook group. I'm not doing it just for fun. I mean, it is fun, don't get me wrong. But I'm doing it because I want to be able to share the things of God. I want to be able to share my testimonies. And I've been saying that I'm going to do my testimony series soon. I am. It's just still nerve-wracking to do it. But I'm going to be doing it before the end of the year. But, um, you know, through sharing my testimony and inviting others to God and to Christ, through sharing the word and um, being as open and transparent as I can without making myself embarrassed, if that makes sense. Um, I'm able to, in a sense, win souls. I've received emails. I've received messages, direct messages on Facebook. I mean, the endless amount of things that a lot of you send me really help me understand that it's through my testimony and through me inviting you guys to Christ in new ways that you're now having, um, that some of you guys are getting saved, not obviously through me, but by accepting Jesus Christ into your life. Um, some of you are being born again if you were already saved. And it's such a beautiful feeling. So I can only imagine how this woman felt um, after hearing so much goodness from him and realizing who he was. And then going to f feeling this compulsion to share it with other people. That's how I feel. And there's times where I don't want to share certain things. Like there are certain things I'm still like holding on. And, the, and God is just like, no, no, no. Share it. Do it. Do it. So... You know, the question there with that is, are you winning souls by sharing your testimony and inviting others to Christ? Inviting them to God. You don't have to be all extravagant and, you know, theological and stuff. You can be as simple as you can be. You can be as real as you can be. You can be you. And bring others to Christ. This, like I said, this lady, she ran. She dropped the very thing she went to the well for. Obviously, she went to this well for water. And then she just happened to run into Jesus Christ, which was a divine appointment that was already predestined, preordained, whatever you want to call it. And then, you know, she didn't even get a chance to get the water she wanted because she was just having such a lovely conversation with him. And like I said, through that conversation, he was pulling her in into wanting to know more. And then... He revealed himself to her by way of telling her what he already knew, but asking questions in a form that would make her answer, even though he already knew the answer. Like, you don't have to be extravagant. You really don't. Um, so, let me just put this here, because that, that's going to irritate me if it's not connected. <laughs> so, from that last part for verse 30, the question is, are you winning souls by sharing your testimony and inviting others to Christ? Like I said, her invitation and testimony pulled others to come to him for themselves. So in me making these videos, it's pulling you guys to now go into your word on your own and study it even deeper. Um, I'm just a help. I'm just a vessel. She was just a vessel. She was just a help. Her invitation and her testimony helped other people to get to Christ. She was a vessel. That's what I am. So are you a vessel to help other people come to Christ? Are you a vessel to help other people to get to know God and it doesn't mean you invite them to church I mean inviting them to church is obviously a good thing but it doesn't always have to be that you can always say hey let me pray for you or you can just say hey I prayed for you for this or you can share a book that you read that you enjoyed or a blog post or a podcast or something like that in which you can invite them and share your testimony so I just said a whole lot just for that one verse I know so <laughs> For this part, I am going to write my note here. Verse 30. Her invitation. Sorry again if you hear that. Like I said, the, the thing is outside of my windows. And testimony. Pull others to come to him. And the reason why I titled this Soul Winner um, is because... Was that, did I say Soul Winner or Soul Winners? Winning. Soul Winner. I titled this Soul Winner because Jesus obviously had a divine appointment to meet 
this Samaritan woman to save her soul. And then in him saving her soul, she now has a testimony to share with other people to save their souls, which in turn is allowing her to help Jesus save souls. Like, are you a soul winner? That's the question. I know I want to be a soul winner, and I am a soul winner, so are you a soul winner? I think this is something we need to really ask ourselves. If not on a daily basis, like every week, once a week, we need to ask ourselves, what did we do this week to save a life, to save a soul? And it doesn't have to be drastic. Sometimes a simple text, a simple email, a simple comment on a picture, because everybody is on social media. So like the, the, the most simplest ways are sending a comment sending a quick text um people do gifs a lot so you can send you can find a gif that's inspirational and send it you can do old school fashion and mail a letter like i next year i really want to start doing um letters where i write letters to you guys uh like probably pick two or three people every week to write a letter to and I think I want to do that I'm gonna start like a spreadsheet or something where I can get you guys' addresses and just be able to correspond with you guys through letters and I'm not doing it to receive anything back I want to do it just because I want to be able to encourage people with whatever they're dealing with whether I know or not so are you winning souls by sharing your testimony and inviting others to Christ. I have work to do after this. Oh gosh, I almost forgot. I got work to do for my church <laughs> after I make this video. So that's that. So, moving to 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. 35. Do you not say, There are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. 37. For here are the saying, for here the, for here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into that labor. Or entered into their level. So that was just verses 31 to 38. And that might be the last of it for today. Which is insane. So I'm probably going to tackle the next couple in another video. Um, Just because I do want to keep this. Like I said under an hour and a half. Instead of two hours. Just because I do have other things to do throughout the day. <laughs> so hopefully you guys understand that. But um, yeah. So that was a lot. That, 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 that chunk. I think that was like nine or eight verses. That was a lot. And you guys, when I say it took me forever to think of my notes for this, it took me forever. Um, I do use other resources to get like my notes, such as commentaries. So it took me a while because I I felt that there was so much in here. And I'm pretty sure there's so much more that I can get out of it. But I'm learning that I don't want to do all the work for you guys. Um, so next year when I do these Bible studies, it will definitely be different. I will have notes, but they won't be extensive because I noticed that these notes are extensive <laughs> and it takes time. So I'm going to do a video towards the end of the year with some updates that will be taking place soon for Daughter of Increase as far as like the Bible studies go. But um, let's just finish this up and then I'll be done for today and then I'll do the next part. I'll record it tomorrow probably and upload it on Saturday so you guys can have the completed thing of chapter 4 before we dive into chapter 5 next week. But, um, okay. So 31, I have no comment for 31. So going to 32, he says, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And then skipping from 33 to 34, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So my food is to do the will of him who sent me and then to accomplish his work. 35, do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Let's 
lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. I'm underlining so I don't take too long just to underline down later. Going to 36, it says, already the one who reaps is receiving wages. Gathering fruit for eternal life. And then I'm going to underline so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. Going down to 37. For here the saying holds true, one sows, another reaps. And then finally, verse 38. Um, I sent you to reap for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. So, that's everything underlined, right? You already know what I'm about to say. Color, because my eyesight. Ever since I've gotten my glasses, it's just like I cannot see as good as I used to without these glasses on. And Crayolas. I'm just putting the color down so that I can just write these notes so we're not here too long. Especially since I ran and did laundry this morning, which is why I was on a little bit later. Or at least why I was trying to get on later, but it just wasn't working when I tried to get on Facebook Live. Almost done with the color. I think I need two more. I try to spread the colors out so they're not so, like, joined together, if you will. Alright, there we go. Got all my color down. So, beginning with... I have food to eat that you do not know about in verse 32. The disciples were concerned with physical food, but Jesus had a better way to receive the nourishment he needed. Um, so this wasn't all about just a physical thing. This was more so a spiritual thing. Um, and I'm going to read two cross references for you guys. Disciples concerned with physical food, physical nourishment. Jesus had a better way. Spiritual nourishment for what he needed. Then I have Deuteronomy 8 and 3, and then Matthew 4 4. I got a message from Facebook. Okay. I'm sorry guys, just give me one quick second, I'm trying to figure out what this is. Okay. 
So again, I'm going to be reading Deuteronomy 8 and 3, and it says, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with mono, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And then I'm going to read Matthew 4 and 4, and I think that's the same scripture around the time when Jesus was fasting and the enemy came. Yes, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the word from the mouth of God. So, um, you know, these disciples were focusing on a spiritual nourishment, I mean a physical nourishment, but this the word tells us that we will not live by bread alone, by physical food. We will live by the word of God. So Jesus understood this and he was getting his nourishment from the word. Like from God's mouth from the word is where his nourishment came from. So, moving on to 34. Yes, so 34. There's two parts to 34. So, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. So, again, Jesus had a greater source of strength and satisfaction with the food. I mean, <laughs> Jesus had a greater... Jesus had... A greater source of strength and satisfaction than the food that he ate. And then it says, uh, and to accomplish his work. So Jesus explained to his disciples that his true satisfaction was doing the work of God. His true satisfaction was doing the work of God and His will. This is proof, so I'm going to say proves how much He surrendered to God's will. And then 35. We are almost done, ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching. <laughs> and I get shocked that men actually watch my channel. I don't know. I just feel like some men don't like to listen to women. Um, especially when it comes to the word, but I thank the men who do actually reach out to me and the men who do watch my channel. I do truly appreciate it, like, a lot. But, um, 35. So, it says, do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? What color is that? I'm gonna take this color. <laughs> so, with that, um, I have a lot written down. So, Basically, this was a proverb with the idea that there is no particular hurry for a task because things simply take time and you can't avoid the waiting. Um, but Jesus did not want his disciples to have this mentality. He wanted them to think and act as if the harvest was ready now. So, Jesus wanted disciples to work now instead of waiting for a particular season and with that being said a lot of people um, will wait to like a specific time like I'm gonna assume like when they're out uh, harvesting like wheat and stuff like that I'm sure that they can see the harvest prior to it fully being the time for everything to be plucked so instead of waiting for it to be like one grand time to pluck for months jesus wanted his disciples to understand that you don't have to wait for a specific season you don't have to wait for a specific time you can actually start doing so at this point in time there's no need to wait to do so and then if you continue to 35 
um, it says, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. So in him saying that, Jesus uses the idea of food and harvest to communicate spiritual ideas. The idea of harvest meant that there are many people ready to be received into the kingdom of God and that the disciples should see themselves as, as the reapers in that harvest, gathering the souls for the kingdom. So basically, there's no reason to wait to gather souls. There's not a specific, a particular season to gather these souls. There's not a particular time, month, day, year. No. If you see a soul, gather the soul. It, it, it was pretty much that simple is how he wanted to say it, see it. So, many people, if you have the printable, you can definitely like read the printable and have the full notes but obviously when I write my notes into my journaling bible I shorthand because I don't want it to be too long so many people ready to be received into the kingdom so should see self as a reaper and gather the souls. Verse 36, um, that was terrible. <laughs> So, verse 36, already the one who reaps is receiving wages. So, your work in the harvest will always be rewarded with either spiritual I'm sorry, your work in the harvest will be rewarded either spiritually or naturally. Work in harvest always rewarded spiritually. I'm going to say and or because some people receive both a spiritual and a natural blessing. Some people will just receive one or the other. Um, so I'm trying to get to these scriptures. Two, 10, okay. Or naturally. We have Romans. 2, 10, and then Galatians. 6, 9. Okay, that was terrible, but whatever. 36 is blue and pink. I don't even know which color I use. Lovely. This one. Okay. So Romans 2.10 says, But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So basically kind of like the uh, reward that's given. And then that didn't make any sense what I just said. <laughs> I'm going to reread that after I finish this verse here. So Galatians 6 and 9, it says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Um, so those are like encouraging scriptures as far as like reaping the harvest. Going back to Romans 2.10, I um, hope I'm on the right one. Yeah, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. So if you want to interchange that from Jew and Greek, you can think of um, to the reaper and then to the sower. And I would say... Dig deeper and look into commentaries because my notes for that actually came from a commentary. And it's hard to explain it right now. And I don't have a lot of time because my camera's going to cut off shortly. <laughs> so, yeah. So, moving on to 36. Uh, for the part where it says gathering fruit for eternal life. So, the good of your work lasts forever. Going on to 37, and we're almost done. Oh no, there's another one for 36, isn't there? Yes. Sorry. 
there's one more part for 36 um, and that's the so the sower so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together and again for that you can also read the Romans 2:10. I knew there was something for that so Romans 2:10 is for that one but um, all workers in the harvest will celebrate in the work all workers in harvest will celebrate now we're moving on to 37 Ooh, something was weird I have like another six minutes before my camera cuts off <laughs> so let's try to get to this so 37 for here the saying holds true one sows and another reaps so I'm gonna say see 1st Corinthians 3 6 through 9 and I'm gonna try to flip to that quickly 1st Corinthians 3 6 through 9 but the note for that is there is always one person who sows the seed and another that can reap Jesus can sow into someone's life and then you can bring them to the kingdom through your work and or testimony so 6 through 9 reads for 1st Corinthians and 3 it says I planted Apollos I planted Apollo's water, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. So one person will always reap, one person will always sow. We work in tandem together so that God can give the increase, therefore we can help by either sowing the seed in someone's life or taking the seed that someone sowed into that life and bringing them to the kingdom so that God can do the rest of the work. And you can do that through either your testimony or service. So, um, one sows and one reaps. But it all brings the glory to God. Verse 38. Um, it says, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Jesus sent his disciples to reap the harvest that was before them. And the last part of that, it says, others have labored and you have entered into their labor. So John the Baptist and Jesus kind of like sold the seeds before the disciples came onto the scene. So John the Baptist and Jesus sold disciples reaped. It's as simple as that. Um, that's my hand handwriting is like chicken scratch, <laughs> but yeah, so John the Baptist and Jesus were the ones who sowed the seeds into these people. And John the Baptist did that by way of these baptisms, which was all about repentance. And Jesus did this because he, you know, he's Jesus, he's the son of God, but, <laughs> um, it was up to the disciples to now take what was sowed and to reap that harvest, to reap the souls that were ready to be bought into the kingdom of God. And they did that by way of, you know, the word, by way of testimony, by way of service. And um, that's pretty much it. So that is it right now, you guys, for chapter four. Let me see if I can zoom out quickly. Um, yeah, so that's it right now for chapter four. So here's everything that we did. I will have part three up soon. But um, part three will just be the last three paragraphs of this because I don't want this to be way past an hour and 30 minutes. Um, probably two hours now. But yeah, 
So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, leave them down below in the comment section. Check the description box for the printable. And if the link does not work, let me know because I know some of you guys have been having trouble with getting the link for the uh, chapter chapter notes. Um, so let me know. And that's pretty much it. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.